Warning. The following program may cause better understanding of life, severe bursts of thought, intense wonderment, chronic curiosity, loss of disinterest, and occasional experimentation. Some listeners have reported sudden inspiration or prolonged brain usage. Those experiencing drowsiness, apathy, or bouncy legs, that's not us. It must be something else you're watching. Science. 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 Kate, thanks for coming out to NSF today. Thanks for having me. Uh, I wanted to start by talking about something that people may not think about much, which is, you know, you're a chemist, mm -hmm. so when you go out and do a demo, it's 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 low-hanging fruit. I mean, you can blow stuff up, automatically people are engaged, mm -hmm. but there's more to it than that, right? Oh, absolutely. So my entire goal is to try to show everybody that anybody can be a scientist. That's really my mission. And so I personally really believe in the theory of emotional memory. It's William James's theory of emotional memory. And basically what that theory says is that if you create an emotional response from your audience, they're likely to remember whatever it is that you're trying to say. And so for me, I use explosions or fire, or liquid nitrogen, um, kind of as a shtick to evoke that emotional response so that as soon as we're done with the demonstration, I have about a minute, it's research says it's about 60 seconds, to shove the knowledge into their head so that they actually remember what it is that we're talking about. They now remember the definition of a physical change or maybe something more complicated, like they actually understand transitions between quantized energy levels. So when you get out there on the stage and you have in mind a lesson that you're trying to get across and then you're basically delivering it in this bomb mm -hmm. that then goes into their head. So when you approach a crowd, are there certain things you're trying to make sure they walk away with as a bare minimum, something that they they take with them? Absolutely. So for me personally, and this is just my personal teaching philosophy, um, what I like to do is I will obviously have my entire lecture planned, but I think about it in five minute chunks. And so what I like to do is start with the emotional response. So do something weird. Um, it could be the explosion if we're doing a demonstration, or it could be something as simple as asking about a real world application or asking a question where you know people are going to have the wrong response to it. So you immediately force them to want to know why they're wrong. What is the correct answer? How should I be thinking about that. Um, and so once you have that aspect, the next four minutes, in my opinion, are really important. Um, personally, I like to talk to the B student, someone who has a decent understanding, but isn't maybe the best person, not the full story. Um, so I love to teach the B student, tell them the majority of everything, but then you have to dive so deep into the nitty gritty details. They want to, the students want to know where the electron is. They want to know where the protons are. Did they move? Did something shift? They want to know everything. And so for me, it's so important to do an emotional response, talk to the majority of your audience, but then you have to hit them with a the hard science. But the most important thing, and this is what people sometimes forget, is you have to end with the, the step back. You, you're going to end with the one sentence. So if you couldn't follow anything that I was just saying there, if you listen to this one sentence I'm going to give you, now you have a shot at understanding again what quantized energy would be. And that gets to the issue of, you know, the, the people will say, well, you want to work to this crowd that, that's the hardest to reach, mm -hmm. and yet the reality is that there, there's, the crowd is much more complicated yeah. than that. <laughs> and the hardest to reach, you know, it's great if you reach them, um, but it also helps to, to give them something that motivates them to want to learn more and mm -hmm. to go somewhere else. At the same time, you're also reaching out to students who might be ex excelling at what they do, and you don't want to lose them in the process. Right. So as a lecturer at, at UT Austin, you have to basically face a class, class you, don't, you, know, you don't pick and choose which student covers what, and no. <laughs> everybody brings something to the equation. The student who may not be great at chemistry might still bring a really awesome element to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring all of those different audiences into your lecture? Well, personally, I believe in the active learning techniques. And so when I lecture at the University of Texas, um, what I do is, like I said, I have those little five minute modules where I, I know my text, but personally, I walk around. So I have a classroom of 500 students and I walk through there. They know I'm coming through. I wear heels so they hear me coming. They know I'm coming behind them. Right. Um, but it's, it's the interactions. I have to talk to my students. I need to know where they're at. Just walking down the aisle, you will hear these beautiful conversations and they're, they're explaining the science in this just beautiful way, but they're wrong. And so you need to be able to address that, compliment them, they're, you're thinking critically, you're doing a great job, but let me give you this one extra sentence. And so for me, and again, this is my personal strategy, I don't believe in saying, 
this is how the science works. Let me explain that to you. You need to let the person figure it out on their own. Um, if I told you pressure and volume are inversely proportional, there's, you might remember that when you walk away, but if I give you a syringe and have you put your finger on one side and open and close it, you will feel the pressure change. You'll feel right. that volume, right. that, that relationship. And so that's something I do in the first three weeks of class. I give every student a syringe. I'm like, let's go, we'll play with it. And I walk around and it's fun. You can shoot, shoot them with water. <laughs> so that, that also brings up another element of it, which is you actually engage the audience into into what they're doing. So I mean, with, when when you do demos like on Colbert or on Wendy Williams, mm -hmm. um, how does the audience react? I mean, do, do they have like you know you're going to get wet in the front type of things? Are they wearing? <laughs> Well, usually they have no idea what they're in for, uh, okay. which I love. <laughs> I love an audience who sees a girl walk out in boots and a blue lab coat. And I, I mean, I'm bubbly. I am who I am. I have to s stick to, you know, I, I like to be my authentic self. Um, but as soon as I start talking, you're going to have the people who want to know everything. They lean in, they're interested, and then you will also have the exact opposite response where they're saying, this is awful, this is terrible, I can't believe I stood in line to get my ticket for Colbert and now I'm sitting through a chemistry lecture. I mean, how did that happen? But um, at least for Colbert, within about 30 seconds, that audience was mine. I had them hooked. And it's, it's because I use my energy. I, I tell them that I am so passionate about chemistry. It's my favorite thing in the world. And if you have just a bare minimum understanding of the fundamental principles of chemistry, you honestly can explain everything that's going on around you. You know, why is a cement truck moving? Why do we use salt on our streets? I'm, I'm from Michigan, so, you know, when it's icy. <laughs> use a lot of salt on the streets. Yeah, yeah, why yeah. do you use that? And why do you use, what type of salt do you use? You know, why is that? And so for me, any time where I can kind of engage people, get them excited about it, and then hopefully maybe believe that chemistry is the best science in the world, that, that's kind of my goal. <laughs> we don't pick favorites at NSF. Oh, right, but, right, right, sorry. But what I will <laughs> say is, is that, that that approach definitely seems to work. What do you do when the audience is other scientists who, um, they still may have something to learn. And, and the one thing I've learned here is that scientists in one field um, are as inexperienced about another field as, uh, as you know somebody might be off the street and yet interested and engaged. Mm -hmm. So how do you reach that audience? Well, to be honest, I have to use the opposite side of my personality. So when I walk into a lecture where I know it's going to be PhD whatever's, you know, yep. I cannot be bubbly Kate where I'm excited and look at this fire and oh, it's green, isn't that amazing? You can't, you just can't. And so for me, honestly, the first 10 minutes of that lecture, that audience hates me. They, they have an opinion about who I am. I used to be a kickboxing instructor when I was in graduate school, so that comes out, they, they can sniff that. Um, but after about 10 minutes with a true academic crowd, they're with me. They understand that I'm an articulate person, I have a brain, and I can talk about chemistry and Mars and geology and everything else. And so it's, it, it just takes a little bit of that interaction, but I do have to prove myself. I have to prove that I have a PhD in inorganic chemistry, that I spent a lot of time working on catalysts that were active for the suzuki mirror cross-coupling reaction. Um, and it, nice. if I don't, you know what I mean? Right. If, I don't, if I don't throw that in there, they immediately want to put me in the fitness instructor who, who likes fire. Well, there's that a credentials, that, mm -hmm. you know, there's, and then this goes for a range of audiences. I mean, I imagine when you do a range of different things, you, you bring to the table whatever credential they need to know to, to move it forward. Mm -hmm. So when you engage those audiences, what are the, what do the lectures look like? I'm, I mean, you probably don't get too far into the weeds, but do you still try to balance it or do you want them walking away being better communicators or do they want, it's more about that just them accepting you. Yeah, it's right. more about walking away from the lecture with something, right? I mean, to be completely honest, I'm the least important part there. I, I like it. I'm selfishly loving what I do, right. but that's that's irrelevant to what's going on. The goal is to, just like you said, A, get your community to be better science communicators. We just have to do that. I'm trying to empower my graduate students at the University of Texas right now. Um, I have several different groups where the whole point is science communication, where I'm trying to teach them how to talk to a kindergartner, a senior in high school, a college kid, a graduate kid, um, an actual PhD, and your grandpa. I mean, there's that whole range. You need to go from five, five's my limit, I can't talk to someone below five, but five to about 70, you have to be able to do that. And it's from a completely different aspect. So there is a science communication component to that as well. But truly, I do want them to learn. I want them to learn. I want them to see exactly what it is that I'm trying to illustrate. I want them to be able to visualize it. And that's right. the hardest part about chemistry, in my opinion, is that it's so minute. It's this micro um, science, for, for lack of better words, but the macro application is everywhere. And so I want to be able to explain micro so that when they see macro, it's like, oh, chemistry. Easy. Yeah, I, I talk to people a lot about how, how you have to 
understand that the public is willing to suspend disbelief. Mm -hmm. You know, they, we see it, we can imagine it. If you get them to that point, then they can go on and, and learn from that. So when you get them to suspend disbelief, what are some of the things you can get them to walk away from with it? Oh, everything. Honestly, everything. So you just, once they buy in, then you can have the conversation and you can talk about the scientific principles. Um, but it, that, it, what you said is the hardest part is actually getting them to believe that or get into that uncomfortable zone. It's right. just, it's difficult. And people, adults don't like feeling vulnerable with their, with their intellect. And that's kind of what you ask them to do. And I'm, I'm young, I'm 32 years old. And so I'm asking adult men to be vulnerable with me. And that doesn't go over well very often. So when you're trying to get people to let go and accept these things, you know, how do you break through that barrier? I mean, I, I think it's not just um, the vulnerability, but it's also just accepting the, the wanting to learn when you're oh, outside of like yeah, sure. a certain community that's engaged, but the general public and, and those sorts of things. Well, it, honestly, it depends on the person. I think you really have to tailor your conversation to that human. One of the first things I want to know is what is your background? Have you ever had a chemistry class? Have you ever had a physics class? Um, and so for me, it's the excitement that I have, the passion that I have about the science. But what I would love to do is then show them something. So if I can point to data, if I can point to a graph, if there's just something, if there's something you can point to, usually they're more willing to come along with you. And it's just like a date. I mean, if you talk about a first date, you're never supposed to go to a dinner and talk to each other because it's internally focused. And so the perfect first date is supposed to be externally focused. So you're looking at a movie, you're going on a walk, looking at something. It's the same thing with science. If I'm looking at someone and trying to force this information, they might not get it. But if I'm pointing to this and talking about it and getting really excited and then gauging their understanding, you can take people to a really deep understanding of quantum mechanics if they give you their attention and the time. Exactly. And you brought this up quite a bit that there's a, there's a human nature to all of this. And there's a lot of science in that. And you were telling me earlier that your family is all, all of their background is not chemistry, but, yeah. but psychology. They're all psychologists. I'm the black sheep of the family. Yes. I don't like emotions, but I do appreciate them. <laughs> well, and you use how the people learn. I mean, mm -hmm. the human being is the human being, yep. right? And so then you get into a situation where everybody thinks that you have to somehow uh, get beyond human nature, but you can also work with human nature to get, like you said, to get the entry point, mm -hmm. to get them to then accept, okay, you blew something up, you have their attention, but then also to get them to spend his belief, and then now you're going to introduce this lesson. Right. So what other things have you picked up from your family that help you <laughs> succeed at what you're doing? I mean, you've very quickly risen, you said you've been doing this about four years, yeah. and you've gone from doing incredible outreach, you were saying, to 20,000 students a year, yes. which is amazing, yes. and you continue that while adding in going to Colbert and Wendy Williams and all of this stuff. So what are you using from the, your, your family's teaching to, to do all of that? Well, part of it is my dad was very big on you control your own emotions. Like, I can't make you mad. You let yourself get mad, basically. And so with that, I try to take that theory and flip it on its head. So I can't make you excited, but I can be passionate and I can be incredibly it may be engaged, I don't know if that's the right word, but engage in what I'm doing. And so I can try to evoke that human response from you that's natural, right. right? And then use that. And I almost feel manipulative doing that, but I honestly am trying to kind of evoke that human response and then hit you with the science, hit you with the, what I think is the best part about planet Earth. The science. It is. I love it. I mean, honestly, I swear I was put on Earth. I know we're the only, that's where we live, but I swear we're here because of science. And I just think it's so incredible, all the things we can learn. And I'm so grateful to be here now when we have the internet, because I think if I was born 50 years ago, my education would be so different. I love that I can pull up the internet after this conversation. If you mention something, I can learn about it and be a quote unquote expert in probably 30 minutes. And right. I just love that. Right. I, you know, experts, that's not fair. Well, I think <laughs> you said I knew you were going to take that back, but, but, but that comes back to your legitimacy. Is that you're, you're a scientist and you understand what's involved in understanding things, but mm -hmm. being able to get a top level understanding in just 30 minutes when you know where to look and mm -hmm. how to look. So as a communicator who's going out there into the world trying to reach the broadest possible audience with things that people may have never seen before, mm -hmm. how do you help people separate between what's, what's reality and what's not? 
Well, that's, it's such a good question because when my students show up, I usually get the incoming freshmen, they're 18, they're learning stoichiometry and how to do their laundry at the exact same time. Right. And so for me, what I'm trying to do is add a third piece in there. What is a good source? Because now they're actually, they have their phones, they have apps, they have everything. So I want to make sure they're looking at what a good, what I would consider to be a good source. So what I do in my class is I break it up by the unit. There's four units per semester. And so every unit, there's like a little lesson. And so the first one is something very simple where it's an article from the onion and oh, I have a beautiful yeah it's talking about a satellite that's going around the earth and it's quite a problem because it's extension cord that's connected to the earth keeps getting tangled oh. and so they're trying right and so they're trying to figure out how to do that and so I just send in this article and I say guys I, I found this great article it's beautiful you should read it done and then we talk about it and half of them know the onions bad but some of them don't know that they don't know and so we just talk about that and we start with the onion because it's a beautiful source and then we and get it's satire so and it's, it's very easy to understand that they intend it to be mm -hmm. right there are a couple students who don't get that and so that's my goal to kind of work through that but after unit one they're with me so that's actually a starting point is that there are students who don't necessarily recognize this even after they read the article they don't mm -hmm. that's important. and I, I work in Texas so there's a huge state and there's a variety of different education levels and what they're taught in the high school so some students honestly can come to UT and on, never having had the conversation about what's a good source they think quoting Wikipedia is okay which don't get me wrong Wikipedia is for the most part, pretty actual and factual, but I want you to go to the real sort. What, what is Wikipedia quoting? Let's exactly. start there. Exactly. Um, so things like that. And that's also a key element, which is that information you may find, and this happens even in science publication, mm -hmm. um, it, it, which we know, but not everybody may know, that, that things can be biased, and so you look to broader sources and expertise and data mm -hmm. to get to things. So, so when you look at science itself as, as an experience and an approach to understanding the universe, and mm -hmm. as you were saying, be, you know, being dropped here and <laughs> trying to learn and understand as much as we can about it, um, how do you look to science when you're trying to answer a question so that you know that it's, it's factual and not biased or pushed in one direction or another? Well, it's a learned skill to be honest. Uh, you have to be able to read through something and say, wait a minute, that felt kind of like an opinion. And so for me, when I look at a peer-reviewed journal, my favorite ones don't ever have the word I or we or anything like that. It's primarily, these are the facts, here's the data. Right. And so for me, it's all about looking at an actual plot, um, something and trying to interpret that basically. And then when kind of you lost your question, sorry. Well, no, no, but then <laughs> when you have that plot and you understand it, but then how do you know when it's something that's completely unfamiliar? Uh, is it a good data set? Mm. Is it a good source? Yeah. Is it? And so for me, I, um, trying to encourage my students to look at peer-reviewed journals. A lot of times that's a brand new phrase. They've never even heard that, and so I have to explain what that is. Um, and so when you set up a list of things, so like science and nature, you know you're getting, well, you, you hope you're getting something that has been vetted and it has accurate information in there right. and more importantly that every single one of the experiments that were run has been replicated and so for me that's a, a big piece as I try to teach my students if you're if the science is not replicated if they're just doing one thing one time and they can't say anything else or you don't notice that that's a good way to notice that you have a bad source as well um, but I really try to get them to identify what a blog is that's a Big step is what is a blog, and a blog is not something that's factual necessarily. They could be the most personal and wonderful educated person writing, but it's also very possible that there's this, there was one case recently where a dietitian was talking about how after you get off planes, they spray you down with chemicals, and all these people were quoting it and like quoting her and everything, and it was it was quite nasty because the scientific community came in and said Let, let's check this let's fact check this and her whole blog got shut down um, and so things like that are shut important down it, was inaccurate. it was inaccurate well I, basically what happened is she was trolled a lot then um, and people were mocking her and then I believe she decided personally to shut it down but as a scientific community it is important to kind of speak up if you see something that is inaccurate and so I personally am very passionate about vaccines um, and so that's something I just can't let somebody say something that's inaccurate around me I have to check that fact check it and so as a community if we do that and encourage people to fact check and then ask the question where did you read that could you send me that article like oh that looks like a blog could you send me the, the I, I'm looking for something a little bit deeper and just ask the question have that person then realize oh wait maybe this isn't actually a good source but if you tell someone the blog's bad they're not going to listen to you. Well, and then there's also the question of how you get beyond peer-reviewed journals because when you and I can jump into a peer-reviewed article and, and, and any topic right. and work our way through it, <laughs> um, but that takes you know a decade or more mm -hmm. of experience to really do that. What is it that 
that somebody who sees something that they're curious about, something that they they want to understand better, what sources can they go to that are, are not necessarily peer reviewed, but are still legitimate and understandable and a accurate, most importantly accurate? Well, it really, to be honest, it depends on what you're interested in. I think it's important to find good, um, easily accessible information that you, that you can have. And so right now we're in the days of the phone, the iPhone, the smartphone. And so I think it's important to have accurate apps that you value. I think NSF is a great resource where you can reach out and they yeah. point you in directions. I think it's fantastic. Um, NIH was kind of with you guys yeah. um, as well. But there's also things, I have an, an app on my phone that's a science app. It's just called Science. And I read that every single day. That's how I start my day. And I like that. I also personally like the science section of the Washington Post. And so I look at those two first um, and then when I have com com conversations with friends colleagues anywhere with the science background right. I mention that and I try right. to put it out there and then you get feedback from others in, in the fields to I do when you have those conversations I do and so for me it's talking to your peers figuring out what they like what they value and I also a hundred percent this is kind of off topic but I really think you need a mentor in this field somebody who's been through this I have incredible mentors unfortunately they're all male um, because there's not very many female mentors out there right now for me but we're gonna change that hopefully um, but they can point you in the right direction and so I have certain um, article or peer-reviewed journals that I never looked at when I was in graduate school because I was in chemistry in organic chemistry that was my world and now I'm stepping back and I, there's some physical chemistry journals that I like, but they're kind of hard for me to understand because it gets right. really deep right. in the math, but I, it's fun for me. And it t personally, I approach it like a puzzle. This is my Sudoku of the day. That's awesome. <laughs> so when you brought up your prior research, mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on the spot okay. a little bit because <laughs> I, when I do science communication outreach, a lot of times I'll throw my abstract up from my master's thesis mm -hmm. because it doesn't in anywhere say that I worked on meteorites. It just uses jargon. Yep. And so I show people, look, I've made this mistake many times. And so in addition to breaking the ice, it shows people that, that you can be an expert in something, but not necessarily be able to communicate it well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, what was your thesis on? Okay. And uh, what was its you know, impact on society? So I did um, about five years, a little over five years, um, studying a direct comparison of homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts that were active for the suzuki mirror cross coupling reaction. Okay. And so personally, I'm really, and this is just for me, I'm very into the environment and green chemistry. And so um, when I was picking my project, obviously my PI was involved, but we wanted to kind of merge those two things. So he worked with the bi-end ligand, the bisaminoacynaptine ligand, and I really liked catalysis for my undergrad, and I liked green chemistry. So we smashed that all together. Smashed is the technical term. Right. And, um, um, we basically took the ligand, which I synthesized, and I put it on palladium, the best metal. Um, and then from there, I tried to figure out how I could have an open site on my palladium because, you know, through the different mechanisms, you have to figure out how you can do your binding. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with the suzuki mirror cross-coupling reaction, basically you're just trying to use a palladium catalyst to form a carbon-carbon bond between two benzene rings. And so I would functionalize my benzene rings, study the different um, aspects of that. But for me, what was most important is I was doing this in water. And so I could use a solvent that was benign. It's not benzene, it's not DCM, anything like that. Sorry, dichloromethane. Um, but it's, it's benign. And so what I loved is that I could study my homogeneous catalyst. We, we completely um, optimized it and figured out how it works best and what pieces it needs to have on there. But then what we did is we tethered that catalyst to a bead of silica. And so what I loved is that I actually made a heterogeneous catalyst so I could physically, with tongs, or tweezers more so, put put them into my vial, because I did everything in small vials, put it in there, rinse off my catalyst, and dump it in the next one. And so I could study it over and over and over again, and so to see what was a better catalyst. Obviously, the homogeneous one was better, because it's in phase, it's more surface area, it's easier to do the catalysis. But I did find out a way to do a reusable, a recyclable catalyst in water. In water. In water. And what I just found out is about maybe, a month ago or so, somebody took my research and another one of my lab mates' research and mashed those together. So now it's an even different catalyst, and it's just, I'm just so happy with where it's going. So that's awesome. So then <laughs> now in the, the, if you were going to explain that to your entry-level students when okay. they walk in the door, what would you tell them? Okay, so. Because it, the other thing is you've got all of these elements of real value to mm -hmm. society. So you, uh, again, the low-hanging fruit here, but you're actually lucky in that you can help incorporate that. But how would you say to explain the research and its value to society. I actually think that's easy. So a catalyst, it, what they're taught in high school, is something that speeds up a reaction, but that's wrong. What it actually does is provides an alternate mechanism. So I start off with saying, usually we go from A to B like this, 
in a crazy way. And then we add this palladium catalyst and boom, it just shoots straight across. So it's a different route basically on, on the highway, however you want to think about different it. Different route to do chemistry. Yeah, different route to do chemistry. And that's, that's where I leave it because they know the word catalyst. I fix their definition of catalysis because that's right. what's most important to me. And then I just say, okay, you've heard of carbon before. So have you seen those little, uh, I'm blanking on the, the shape. What's a benzene? It's a hexagon. hexagon. Thank you. <laughs> if you've seen these hexagons, I draw a line between them. And using palladium makes me able to create that carbon-carbon bond. And carbon-carbon bonds are essential for life. They're in drugs. They're in all pharmaceuticals. They're in every, I mean, they're even in just synthesis to make a more complicated, you know, molecule, whatever it is that you're trying to do. And so it's essential for chemistry. And so I tried to figure out a way to do that safely in benign solvents and in the best way possible. Great. They're still working on it, though. No, that's great. <laughs> and I think, you know, when you get to the benign solvents and, and the, the fact that, um, there's this move and push towards those those sorts of alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's really saying something about where chemistry is moving, that there's a lot of, of that activity. We have to. If we don't lead this, then it's no one else is going to do it. No NSF isn't just going to be like, hey, here's a bunch of money. Go stu study this in water. But if I say, hey, I have this incredible idea of how I can use something that's always been um, done in an organic solvent, but now I think I can do this in an aqueous material and promote it and write a good grant for you guys, then, <laughs> then it's possible to get that. But if we don't advocate for ourselves and work together, it's, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. No, absolutely. So thank you for spending all the time talking to us. I wanted to, to close by asking you more about what motivates you to keep doing what you're doing. You're, you're sort of starting your career, but you're un far enough into it that you really see this direction. Um, and what is it that's driving you to continue to do this outreach and to keep going year after year? Oh, how much time do you have? This yeah, is the last yeah, question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say it's threefold. So this is, com everything that I'm doing is purely selfish. I love being in front of a crowd. I enjoy it. It is, it's 100% where I'm supposed to be. So I have to acknowledge that. But more importantly, there is nothing better than when you have a conversation with a student and you see the light bulb moment. Yeah. That's, I will do this for the rest of my life for that exact, that just, there's a story with my sister when she came downstairs and she was crying hysterically in high school because she was having trouble solving a problem. And I fixed it like that. And I watched her turn into this like confident sophomore. And she, you know, she just felt smart and beautiful. And I will never forget that moment because that's when it started for me. I realized what I had just done. I really didn't do anything. I just kind of pointed to some things to let her brain make the connection it needed to make. Um, and so that's, that's really where that's at that honestly the true answer to what you said is that but the last thing I would say is that I had an incredible high school teacher her name was Mrs. Kelly Palsrock in um, Portage Michigan so small town but she was my sophomore teacher and she loved chemistry and I fell in love with it because of her so ever since I was 15 I knew I wanted to be a chemist so this isn't a tribute to Mrs. Palsrock but it's definitely something I, I just I want her to be proud of me I hope she is. I, am, I Please, cannot <laughs> imagine that she's not proud of you. I imagine she is completely excited. You'll have to ask her if she saw you on Colbert. And, and see what I'm going to see her next you. week, so I'm going to ask her. That's great. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you us. for your time. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Thank you.